Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. The topic for our webinar this afternoon is Can Virtual Power Plants Replace Peaker Plants? A conversation with CEG and Brattle Group. Before we pass this over to our exciting panel of speakers, a few quick webinar logistics to go over here. Um, if you'd like to minimize your webinar console to view the presentations full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled here. You can also click on that orange arrow to expand your webinar console. One reason you may like to do that is to submit your questions and your comments. We'll be saving about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A with the audience. And that is one of my favorite parts of the webinar. Uh, submit your questions. We will be excited to get to them. Finally, this webinar will be recorded. We will send you a copy of the webinar recording and the slides in a follow-up email uh, today or tomorrow, and we'll also post those materials on CEG's website. So with that, I will now pass it over to my colleague, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a senior project director here at Clean Energy Group, and he will get us started. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the webinar. I'm going to turn my webcam on and um, do a brief introduction, and then we will introduce speakers, and then we will get going. Uh, so this is a webinar presented by Clean Energy Group. Um, if you're not familiar, Clean Energy Group is a nonprofit located in Vermont, but working nationwide uh, on affordable, reliable, clean energy for all and with a uh, witty focus. Um, we have a number of project areas that you're welcome to explore on our website, uh, clean, cleanegroup.org. And the focus areas you can see here, climate resilience and community health, distributed energy access and equity, energy storage and flexible demand, and fossil fuel replacement. I think we're hitting all four of those uh, in today's webinar. And uh, it is a webinar that's uh, presented as part of our Phase Out Peakers initiative. Um, and you'll learn more about that later because we have two speakers who are going to be introducing that initiative and talking about how that uh, initiative, what that has to do with virtual power plants, which are the topic of today's webinar. So, and again, you can go to our website, cleaninggroup.org for the phase out peakers project and learn more the next slide please so uh, i'm going to very briefly introduce the speakers and each of them will then uh, give you a little bit more information about themselves uh, as we go but uh, in brief and in order we're going to be hearing today from ryan Lidick, a principal of the brattle group he's going to be talking about the new report from brattle looking at the value of virtual power plants. Uh, we will then hear from Shelley Robbins and Seth Mullendore. Uh, they are both with Clean Energy Group and we'll be talking about the uh, Peaker initiative I mentioned. And then I will wrap up with some information about energy uh, storage programs and policy that can help to support the development of virtual power plants. Uh, we will then have questions. So if you have questions as we go questions occur to you or comments occur to you please type them in um, and i will be sort of looking through them and um, hopefully we will have a good amount of time at the end to get to as many of those as possible so um, next slide please i think that may be it for the introductions so i will now turn well, let me just say a couple of things uh, before I turn this over to, to Ryan. First of all, um, I want to thank him for being here. Uh, you know, the if you're not familiar with this this work, um, you know, the the entire the virtual power plants are sort of uh, one piece of a movement from an old model to a new model in terms of how we handle energy, how it is. Um, how electricity is created, bought, sold, uh, uh, transported across time and space, and consumed. And so, um, you know, this this has a lot to do with uh, this transformation in the power system. And 
uh, as we develop new technologies such as solar and storage and demand, other demand response technologies, and as we uh, expand our concepts, uh, concepts such as efficiency uh, and uh, energy independence and democratization of, of the energy systems that we have, uh, we, we need to start learning more and exploring more about what are the real monetizable values of these new systems and new technologies? How does that fit into the energy economy that we have? And how do we make sure that the markets um, you know, evolve and get updated and changed in such a way that uh, it makes sense to make these kinds of investments and that you can actually monetize the, the, the many benefits of them? So uh, having said that, I hope that's helpful and I'm going to turn this over now to Ryan from Rattle Group. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Todd. That was that was really helpful context for the presentation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thanks very much to the Clean Energy Group for inviting me. Um, as Todd mentioned, I'm a principal at the Brattle Group. The, the focus of my consulting practice is on all the really complex and interesting and exciting regulatory and planning questions that are starting that we're starting to that are being asked and that we need to answer as customers become more proactive consumers and, and producers of electricity on the power grid. Um, so with this presentation, I'll just spend about 15 minutes giving you kind of the highlights of this study on the economics of, of virtual power plants that we developed for Google, uh, but definitely encourage you to uh, take a look at the report because there's a lot more interesting detail there. Um, so I'll just start with a brief definition of a VPP. I think we, you know, we don't want to spend a lot of time defining VPPs because in my mind it's more of a concept, uh, as Todd was saying, than it is something that really needs to be carefully defined and put into a box. Um, but just to give you a sense of how we were thinking about VPPs in this study, we define them as a portfolio of distributed energy resources that are actively controlled to provide benefits to the power system, to consumers, and to the environment. Um, and what you're seeing in the little green box on the left here um, are just examples of potential elements of a virtual power plant. So it could be um, demand response from smart thermostats, from electric vehicles, from uh, smart water heaters or grid interactive water heaters. It also could include output from rooftop solar PV, from distributed batteries, um, and then also you know, advanced demand response from commercial buildings. Um, so the idea with a virtual power plant is that a utility or an aggregator will control those distributed energy resources and then ultimately the control of those resources is done in an orchestrated managed way to provide benefits to the power system whether that's the bulk system involving generation and, tran and transmission or the more local distribution system ultimately the goal is to reduce the cost of running the power system and to make energy more affordable for consumers and also um, to reduce emissions. And then ultimately, if those goals are achieved, then the idea is for those benefits to be shared between the, the firm, the organization that's, that's running the program, as well as participants in that program, and then ideally with, with uh, customers of, of the power system more broadly. So that's just generally how we're thinking about VPPs. Um, I think a reason that it's important to be having this conversation now is in our view, we're, we're really potentially at a, an inflection point when it comes to VPP deployment. There are a number of drivers right now that are pu pushing us in, in this direction. Um, we're seeing the cost of distributed energy resources, solar, battery, and others um, coming down pretty rapidly. And I think there's a long run expectation that those cost declines will continue. We're seeing a lot of technological advancement, particularly around some of the software that's needed to manage all of these DERs in an orchestrated way. The Inflation Reduction Act is reducing the price of these technologies. FERC Order 2222 is designed to give distributed energy resources an opportunity to participate in wholesale markets on a level playing field. And then we're also seeing you know, growth in model availability of electric vehicles in, in particular, but also of, of some other distributed energy technologies. And behind all of this is the decarbonization imperative, which is driving, as you know, a ton of activity on the policy side, on the technology development side, on the regulatory sides of the industry. So the figures we're showing on this slide, um, this is just a summary of a few different analyst projections. 
that are showing between now and 2030 um, their expectations around adoption of various distributed energy resources. And depending on which DER we look at, you know, generally what we're seeing is an increase of, of between 3x and 10x the level of adoption that we have today over just that you know, less than 10 year period. So definitely potential for, for an explosion in kind of in the eligible customer base that could be participating in VPPs going forward. So why did we do this study? Um, you know, when we looked at the data, what we saw is $120 billion uh, has been invested in capacity, generation capacity that has been built primarily for resource adequacy purposes over the last decade. Um, what you're seeing in the chart on the right is just an annual snapshot of that capacity as it was being built. Um, as you can see, it's about 110 gigawatts that were added between uh, 2012 and 2021. Most of that has been gas capacity, but increasingly over the last couple of years, we've also started to see utility scale batteries being developed uh, to meet resource adequacy needs as well. Um, that's the historical view. Our view is that this, this need for new capacity is going to persist into the future. It's going to be driven by peak, peak electrification related peak demand growth, coal retirements and retirements of other fossil generation, and then also a growing dependence on renewables, which are a great source of clean energy, um, but don't always contribute to our, our resource adequacy needs in a, in a significant way. So with our study, we really set out to answer two questions. The first question was, can VPPs reliably serve our resource adequacy need in the same way that, that gas peakers and batteries have historically? And then can v those VPPs compete economically with those conventional resources, gas peakers and utility scale batteries. So those are really the two research questions that defined our study. Um, jumping straight into that first question about can VPPs um, operate reliably? What we found in our analysis is that the VPP that we modeled could provide 400 megawatts of resource adequacy to our, our model moderately sized utility of about 1.7 million customers. Um, we define this utility looking out into the future at its resource adequacy needs in 2030 and modeled the utility um, based on an assumption that about half of its half of the utility's load would be served from renewable generation, wind and solar by 2030. So this is a, a decarbonizing um, utility system. What you're seeing in the chart uh, with the solid blue line is the 24 hour net load profile of this utility on its peak net load day in the summer. And then the dashed orange line is showing how that load shape changed after the VPP that we modeled was dispatched. Um, the way we set out and defined our study, the VPP was composed of four commercially available residential demand flexibility technologies, behind the meter batteries, home managed EV charging, just one direction, not, not V to G, smart water heating or grid interactive water heaters, and then also smart thermostats, which provided both a demand response benefit and an energy efficiency benefit in our analysis. Um, so what you can see if, if you look back at the chart is um, in all hours when a 400 megawatt de uh, demand reduction was needed for this system, the VPP was able to provide that, that demand reduction. And what that ultimately required was that the VPP be able to operate during seven consecutive hours during that evening net peak. This is just a snapshot of what happened on the peak day, um, but ultimately the VPP needed to be able to be used during other days of the year and hours of the year in order to ensure that the utility was getting the 400 megawatts during any hour when it needed it for reliability purposes. And so ultimately in our simulation, what that meant was that the VPP needed to, to be available to operate in both the summer and the winter, actually across seven different months of the year. And the VPP needed to be dispatched during 63 hours of the year. Um, so this is definitely a shift in how we think about demand flexibility um, whereas historically it's been an emergency based resource that we've tried to use as little as possible, providing these types of benefits from VPPs going forward is going to involve a lot more active dispatch and, and reliance on these resources. Um, but our view is that that's, that's very possible and all the, the results of the simulation that you're seeing here um, are all tied back to um, specific considerations around 
uh, customer comfort and convenience and the actual impacts that have been achieved from these types of programs when they've been rolled out by utilities and aggregators in the market. Um, so we did, with these simulations, want to tie back all of the impacts that we are modeling, all of the operational constraints that are associated with, with running a, a VPP program or a demand flexibility program, back to the actual observed performance of these resources when they've been rolled out across the US. And the report has a lot more detail on kind of the modeling assumptions and, and techniques that went into making sure that we were representing this VPP's performance in a realistic way. So that's the story around uh, reliability. And then the next question that we set out to answer was um, the economics. How do the economics of getting 400 megawatts from a VPP compare to getting 400 megawatts of capacity from a gas peaker or a utility scale battery? So just starting with the gas peaker, um, what we're showing in this chart, first on the left, in this dark blue bar, is the cost, the gross cost of getting those 400 megawatts from, get, from a gas peaker. So this represents the capex of, of building the gas peaker, as well as the fuel and the O&M that are necessary to, to run the unit. Um, but this gas peaker will provide some benefits to the power system. When you're adding a new efficient gas peaker to your system, that will displace older, less efficient units that otherwise would be running. So that's showing up in our analysis in the form of uh, energy and ancillary services benefits. Um, when you subtract those benefits from the cost, you're left with a net cost of about $43 million per year to get 400 megawatts of resource adequacy from a gas peaker. So that is you know, referred to as the net cost of new entry or net cone in, in most markets. So that's a gas peaker story. We did the same analysis for utility scale batteries. And here you can see that the picture is somewhat similar. Actually, the cost, the annualized cost of getting 400 megawatts of capacity value from utility scale batteries is similar to the peaker at between 70 and $80 million per year. What's a little different is in our base case simulations, the utility scale battery provided more energy and ancillary services benefits than the peaker. Um, and the reason for that is the economics of, of running batteries in this market were such that the battery was, was able to operate more often on more days of the year and, and provide more energy and ancillary services benefits in that way. So ultimately, the, the economics of the batteries look more attractive than the gas peaker, but you're still left with about $29 million in net costs associated with getting 400 megawatts of resource adequacy from this resource. Then we come to the VPP, um, and here the story looks different. So the first thing that I'll draw your attention to is the dark blue cost bar on the left. Um, what we're seeing here is that the total cost of developing 400 megawatts of the VPP in our analysis is lower than what we're seeing for either the gas peaker or the utility scale battery. The perspective that we took on cost here was the perspective of the utility that's going out and procuring these resources. So when it comes to the VPP, the costs that we're including are the participation incentive costs associated with paying customers to sign up for these programs, um, program administration and marketing costs to, to advertise the programs, <clears throat> and then also the software DERMS cost associated with um, incrementally going out and, and being able to control, actively control all these different distributed energy resources that are located across the system. So those are the costs that you're seeing here. Um, and then the other kind of major major difference to highlight is <clears throat> the benefits bar for VPPs shows a number of different benefits that are being stacked up to, to provide the total value. Um, because distributed energy resources are distributed and they're located at the edge of the grid, they provide us with the ability to avoid investment in, in the distribution grid in particular in a way that transmission connected gas peakers or utility scale batteries cannot. So that's one major potential source of, of incremental value that we get from VPPs. The other big differentiator, differentiator here is the emissions value. Um, in our analysis, we evaluated any change in, in marginal emissions associated with these resources um, at an assumed social cost of carbon at about $100, at $100, of, uh, ton, per, $100 per ton of carbon. Um, and the VPP is, is providing carbon reductions 
primarily through the energy efficiency benefit of the smart thermostat programs. Um, so when you combine those social benefits of emissions reductions with the other types of resource benefits that DPPs can provide, you can see that those benefits almost outweigh the costs and you're left with a net cost of only $2 million per year of getting 400 megawatts of resource adequacy from this DPP under our base case conditions. Um, you know, we did want to test how robust these findings were. So we um, ran a number of sensitivity cases, I think a dozen sensitivity cases, and did find that the numbers move depending on what you assume about system costs and emissions rates and things like that. Um, but ultimately what we found is that this is a pretty robust finding, this, this general comparison of economics that we're looking at here. Um, and definitely, you know, encourage you to take a look at the report to, to get a sense of what the results of those sensitivity cases look like. But this is the snapshot from you know, the perspective of our utility. We did also wanna try and put this into the context of what these benefits could mean at a national scale. Um, so RMI estimated that about 60 gigawatts of VPPs could be deployed nationally by 2030. When we extrapolated these results to that level, what we found was that VPPs could save between 15 and $35 billion in resource costs. So energy ancillary services and T&D T and D investment relative to the alternatives over a 10 year period. Um, and then when we look beyond just resource cost savings to also include the societal benefits of emissions and resilience, that adds an additional $20 billion uh, in benefits over that period. Um, so pretty remarkable scale of benefits when you think about it um, across the entire US. Um, the report also includes a lot of discussion around other potential VPP benefits that we haven't quantified here. I won't go through all of that. I do just want to highlight one other consideration that I think is important for us to be thinking about. And that is, um, you know, I think there's been increased awareness around um, the need for capacity uh, and contributions to resource adequacy in the short term. NERC released a report recently um, highlighting the potential for shortage, uh, the potential for supply risks across major portions of the US in the near term. And there's a lot of capacity that wants to help solve that problem, but it's currently stuck in interconnection queues. There are a lot of things that are being done to try and relieve some of those interconnection queue constraints, but none of that's going to happen overnight. Um, and this is where I think VPPs are uniquely positioned to help us address this problem because VPPs don't go through transmission interconnection uh, processes. Basically, you can scale up a VPP as quickly as you can sign customers up for the program. And that, to me, presents a, a pretty interesting near-term opportunity to get ahead of some of these emerging reliability concerns that we're starting to observe around the country. So those are the benefits. And I'm going to conclude in just a couple minutes with um, some perspective on kind of what we think needs to happen in order for all this potential to be realized, because it isn't being realized yet today. Um, and we've really thought about this in sort of four distinct areas where we, we think, where, where we've in our report described the ideal conditions for maximizing VPP value. Those are market design, technology innovation, policy support, and the regulatory framework. So with market design, um, you know, we do need wholesale markets that provide a level playing field for demand side resources. We also need retail rates and programs that are incentivizing participation in VPPs in innovative customer-centric ways. Um, and I think, you know, this at the retail level, this idea of subscription pricing and using subscription-based fees to promote adoption of VPPs is an interesting and pretty underappreciated area. With technology innovation, um, we need DERs to be widely available and affordable. Uh, we're making a lot of progress in that area. We also need DERs that can communicate with each other and the system operator. And then beyond that, we then need, once that communication ability is established, we need algorithms that can effectively optimize DERs while also maintaining customer comfort and convenience so that customers actually want to participate in these programs. In terms of policy support, you know, codes and standards definitely can, de can promote deployment of flexible end uses, R&D funding, supports the removal of key technical barriers. Um, and we're seeing DOE in particular being very active in this area in terms of um, you know, developing some, some support for around VPPs. And then lastly, the regulatory framework. I think a, something that has been um, slowing down VPP deployment and adoption 
for a while, it's, it's, it's not a, a new issue, is the fact that utilities don't currently have, in most cases, financial incentives to go out and pursue cost-effective VPPs relative to investments in other grid infrastructure. So we really need a business model and a regulatory model that aligns the utilities incentives with, with doing more of this. And then ultimately, I think once we do that, we will see that utility resource planning, cost effectiveness evaluation is, is going to more comprehensively account for the value of VPPs. Um, so that's a lot. I'm just quickly moving on to my last slide here where um, we just wanted to highlight what we consider to be three key low risk actions that utilities and regulators could take now to start moving forward in this space. Um, the first is conducting a jurisdiction specific VPP market potential study. Well, I think the general findings of our study were very robust. We will see the numbers changing and some of the nuanced relationships changing across any different given market or utility system. So a, a jurisdiction specific market potential study is an important first step then we can use that to establish some VPP procurement targets or goals or requirements. It also helps to, to pilot VPPs that can be done to prove technology, but we also see that as being an important opportunity to, to test some innovation around utility, financial incentive mechanisms and business models as well. Um, and then lastly, we think every state would probably benefit from just a review and an update to existing policies for evaluating the benefits of VPPs to make sure that that value is being uh, comprehensively accounted for. Um, so the link is here to the report. Definitely encourage all of you to look at that. But with that, I will stop and um, hand it back to the Clean Energy Group and I'm looking forward to Q&A. Thanks, Ryan, that was terrific. Um, we're gonna bring Shelley and Seth on to start to talk about peakers. And I just want to mention that uh, we do have a lot of questions already. Um, please type those in as soon as they occur to you. Uh, and we're going to do our best to get to a bunch of them after the presentations. Shelley, it's Thanks, all Todd. you. Thanks, Todd. Um, Ryan talked about the solutions. So, uh, he started on a really bright note. I'm going to bring us down um, to the problem. Um, and he talked about um, peaker plants. And so I'm going to define those and talk about why they are, um, you know, I'm going to bring it to the human level. Again, I'm Shelly Robbins. I'm with CEG and I'm a pro, uh, pro project director with the Phase Out Peakers um, project. Um, peaker plants, um, they we have kind of a general definition for them. They run during periods of high electricity demand, the peaks on the grid. Um, but because they uh, turn on and off quickly, um, ramp up and down, they're less efficient. And when they're less efficient, they're burning more fuel to produce energy, therefore they have higher emission rates. They emit um, quite a bit of NOx, and I'll come back to NOx in a few minutes. They're located close to population centers, close to load. And in urban areas, load is people. Um, they have a low capacity factor, which means the capacity factor is the percent of time that they are contributing to the grid compared to how much they have the capacity to do so. So they don't run very often. Um, they, we, we define peakers as those having a capacity factor of 20% or less. Um, we're kind of following EPA, new EPA kind of definitions on that. Um, they typically only operate a few hours at a time. And that's Ravenswood in New York City. Yeah. Oh, I need to click on it before I advance it. Okay, so what do peaker plants look like? They're, they tend to be pretty surprising. A lot of people have no idea they have a peaker in their community. A lot of people think about the peaker plant might look like that big uh, brick and perhaps limestone structure in the background, but actually it's those little white boxes in the foreground. Um, so that is the Chester peaker in Philadelphia it was placed on the site of an, you know, an existing power plant. Um, but that's, to, that's often what a peaker looks like. And here are a couple more. This is the um, on the left, got a lovely little paint job. This is the Delaware combustion turbine in Philadelphia. And on the right is the sup superior gas turbine in Detroit. So just to kind of show you that they, they don't necessarily look like what they think um, people look like. And so people often don't even know that they're in their neighborhoods and in their communities um, uh, emitting NOx. Uh, um, 
All right, so these, this is a map of peakers in the United States. You see how they're sort of spread across. You can see that they are near population centers. There are over 217 gigawatts of fossil peaker capacity in the U.S., and so 28% of the fossil uh, power plant capacity, or almost a third, is peaker plants. That is why they are so important. Their average capacity factor is really around 5%, so they are a lot of of plant, a lot of emissions that don't run all that often, which is why they are ripe for replacement. On this map, the size of the dot indicates the size of the plant in megawatts, um, and then the color uh, indicates how uh, how little it runs. So the, the more yellow it is, it runs more. The more red it, in, it is, it runs less. So all that red tells me that we have a lot of peaker plants that are ripe for replacement with something better. Now. Another aspect of peaker plants is that they are disproportionately located near low-income communities and communities of color. And this map illustrates the low-income piece. This is uh, from a tool on our website at cleanegroup.org. This shows the peaker fleet sorted by proximity to low-income communities. Blue is higher income and kind of the orange to red is lower income. So this map alone makes it very clear. Um, the disparity that exists in our peaker fleet today. All right, so why? I'm going to bring it back to Knox. Um, why are these peaker plants so bad in communities? If they don't run that often, why are they so bad? Well, Knox, they emit Knox. Um, they, because of the way they run, you, you pretty much can't capture that NOx uh, because they don't run at base load level. The systems that capture pollutants don't work on these plants. Um, some of them are literally jet engines. Um, so picture that. Um, so on the left, NOx contributes to what's called secondary PM 2.5. And so on the left, if, picture this, not to scale, is um, uh, uh, 2.5 micrometers in diameter particle of, of, uh, um, in the air. A human hair is 50 to 70 micrometers in diameter. The alveoli in your lungs are 200 mic micrometers in diameter. So that PM 2.5 has no trouble at all getting into the lungs, um, through the lungs, and throughout the body. And what it does, um, we're understanding this increasingly. Historically, they've been able to track sort of the, the, the effects, and now we're beginning to understand how this happens. They, uh, they, the immune system attacks the PM2.5 like a virus, but it can't get rid of it, so it keeps attacking and causes inflammation issues throughout the body. It's been linked with cognitive decline, linked to Alzheimer's impacts on the nervous, nervous system. It's linked to Parkinson's, causes cardiovascular issues such as strokes, heart attacks, coronary artery disease, respiratory issues. You know, asthma is what we usually think about, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. And asthma is a big enough problem by itself. COPD, lung cancer, it's linked to kidney disease, diabetes, and even premature birth low birth weight, miscarriage, and diminished fertility. So that, that is why these peaker plants um, really need to be removed from the grid as, as quickly as we can do so with, with clean alternatives. Now, just a, a little bit more about kind of where they're located. This one um, usually gets some gasps. This is a Dearborn Industrial a uh, gas turbine in um, Detroit, and that is an elementary school and a playground right there. The community has been very active in uh, opposing expansion of this plant, but the plant itself, the stacks of the two shorter ones, um, still exist in that community. And from what I hear, when there are uh, high ozo days, the, the kids cannot go out to play. So these, this is keeping children inside. If they do go outside, um, you know, over repeated exposure over their over their um, lifetime, it creates a lot of problems. And then another one, this is the Schuylkill uh, combustion turbine in Philadelphia. And you see those houses on the right and those stacks on the left, it's just right there, right in the community. So this, you know, this we know what, we know what they do, we know where they are. Um, we have a, a lot of alternatives um, to close these down, and so that's we, we need to get moving on that. 
And if you want more information on what of uh, any of the health uh, implications, you can go to our website. We published the Peaker problem last year, looking at Philadelphia, Boston, and Detroit. Um, but also we uh, loaded it with a lot of general information about Peaker plants, um, how to find information about them, the health implications, and that's on our website. And I'll turn it over to Seth. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Uh, so I'm going to get back to some solutions here uh, and once I get my slides up. So a uh, clean energy group and, and myself personally have had the honor of being a part of the Peak Coalition for the past several years. Uh, Peak Coalition is uh, a group of organizations that's uprose the Point CDC, which are both community-based organizations in in neighborhoods with with uh, Peaker power plants, uh, New York City. Environmental Justice Alliance, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and Clean Energy Group um, came together to, to end the long-standing pollution burden from peaker power plants on the city's most vulnerable people. Uh, so we are working towards accelerating the re retirement of these power plants and replacement with clean non-combustion alternatives. This is a snapshot of what peakers in New York City look like. Uh, in total, there's about six gigawatts of peaking capacity. It's a little bit lower now since when uh, the peak coalition started uh, several years ago, as uh, some of these have, have already shut down. There are about 19 uh, power plants in total acting as peakers. You can tell the, the size from, from the, the, the size of the bubbles here. Uh, the ones that are red are, are old. They are more than 55 years old. And you can see the overlap with uh, communities of color here, the environmental justice impacts of these bigger power, bigger power plants, which is part of the reason why uh, Clean Energy Group got into peaker opposition and, uh, and why the peak coalition exists. Uh, in 2019, uh, peak coalition put out uh, this report called the Fossil Fuel Endgame. Uh, we worked with a consultant, Strategy and Consulting, to analyze what it would take to shut down all of the city's bigger power plants and replace them with clean alternatives. Uh, some of the just background on this, there are about uh, 89 peaking units. Uh, there's multiple units at a lot of these, these power plants in New York City. And 79 of those, the vast majority, run less than 5% of the time. As Shelley was saying, at 5% average. 60 of them, still a big majority, ran for less than 1%. That's fewer than 100 hours per year. And Ryan's example in the, the Brattle Group looked at, you know, those um, virtual power plants were operating for 63 hours a year. That's basically what the majority of the, the peaker power plants in New York City are doing, operating at the same capacity factor as, as that virtual power plant. Uh, uh, so three quarters of a million people in New York City live within one mile of the Beaker plant, and 78% of that population is either low income or people of color. Uh, but much of that population is, is both low income and a person of color. What the report found was that all of the city's Beaker power plants could be reliably and cost effectively replaced by a mix of offshore wind, rooftop solar, energy efficiency, and battery storage by 2023. That replacement would save customers a billion dollars in energy market costs by 2035 and avoid another billion dollars in environmental and health costs. Well, just, just a snapshot of what that looks like as far as uh, resource development by 2025 and 2030. These are big numbers. Um, we're talking about six, uh, 5.6 gigawatts of rooftop solar by 2030, 3 gigawatts of wind. Uh, 5,400 gigawatt hours of, of energy efficiency and uh, about four gigawatts of eight hour duration energy storage. Um, these are big numbers, but these are all well within the targets that uh, the state of New York has established for itself uh, for, for goals. Um, some of these uh, targets that are listed in here are actually outdated. Uh, the state has a six gigawatt energy storage goal now and a 10 gigawatt uh, solar uh, goal for the state. Um, so this graph just shows what, uh, what the problem comes in with the, the matching of uh, renewable resource generation with the demand. So this is where we get into the need for energy storage and, and really flexible demand, the kind of flexible demand that a virtual power plant can provide. 
The dotted line uh, shows the demand for electricity. Uh, the green shows offshore wind generation and uh, rooftop solar is the, the yellow. So there's plenty of capacity there, but it's not all at the same time that there's, there's demand. And this is where we get into, in, in this analysis, we really just focused on battery storage as that's demand flexibility. You can see here the, the charging in blue and discharge overlay of the battery storage systems. And this is in August when, when we've got really high levels of demand on the system um, to fill in those gaps. But these same gaps could be met by virtual power plant. In fact, uh, the, the New York system operator, the, the, the NISO, New York Independent System Operator, just identified a, a reliability gap, a resource gap uh, that it expects in, in potentially for 2025 of 400 megawatts. Now they're saying they might have to keep some peaker plants that are slated to close online to meet that. Uh, but in Ryan's example, you know that was a, a utility serving 1.7 million customers with 400 megawatts of virtual power plant capacity. New York City's got a lot more people in there, around 8 million people right now. Um, there's much more capacity to develop a virtual power plant in New York. And it's very difficult to build resources, as, as Ryan was saying. Now, some of these peakers are going to be replaced by batteries, but virtual power plants can be developed much quicker. and can meet that 2050 uh, resource uh, reliability shortfall with, with no problem at all. So we're very big proponents, um, peak coalition of demand response and virtual power plants and see that as, as part of the solution. Uh, so now I'm going to end my presentation and turn it back over to Todd to talk more about some enabling programs to um, make sure that those resources are online and available to meet this demand. Great. Thank you very much, Seth, and thank you, Shelley. Um, I'm going to do my best to get through my slides quickly since uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left and we do have a lot of questions. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, something called Connected Solutions, which is kind of a, a weird name because it uh, uh, it's it's more or less a, a, a name that was come up with by a utility for a specific program, but we apply it to a sort of broader category of programs. And um, so if I can get these slides to there we go. Um, yeah, so we've heard a lot about um, you know what virtual power plants are and why they are important, how they can provide lots of benefits, and especially with regard to um, sort of short-term, but very important and valuable energy services, such as what is currently mostly provided by bigger plants. But virtual power plants don't just sort of spring up organically. Uh, you can put solar on the roof and you can put a battery in your house or your business, so you can get yourself an EV and a high, uh, you know, remote control thermostat. But if all that stuff isn't aggregated and connected into a uh, system that can be dispatched um, on a signal that, that can be used to provide grid services, then it doesn't provide those sorts of benefits that we're looking for. It provides some benefits, but not, uh, it's not part of a virtual power plant until it's connected. And so, and as I said in the beginning, this is part of kind of a larger movement away from the old model power grid, <clears throat> which was one-way power flows from the generator down to the consumer to a more modern, decentralized, flexible, resilient, and highly variable model with two-way or multiple direction power flows and uh, variable generation and storage. So how do we get there? Uh, one thing that uh, states can do is to adopt uh, this connected solutions model. And I'm gonna step through it, kind of explain how it works and what its key features are. Essentially, this is a funding mechanism that allows the formation of virtual power plants. Through this mechanism, homes and businesses with batteries and uh, other types of renewable resources can supply capacity and energy to the grid during peak demand times 
um, and also retain the use of those batteries for resilience and, and other needs. And in return, they get paid by the utility, whereas the utility would ordinarily pay a peaker plant, now they're paying participating customers for these services. So key elements here of the program model. First thing is that battery storage gets incorporated into the state's energy efficiency program. And this isn't always the case. Um, in some cases, it's a it's incorporated into a sort of demand response program. We recommend that it be done through the efficiency program. <laughs> and I'll explain why um, in a minute. Secondly, uh, customers purchase or lease batteries uh, and, and other eligible types of equipment and sign a multi-year contract with the utility to provide paid performance. And thirdly, um, the utility then dispatches this aggregated distributed system to reduce electric demand peaks, which saves money for all the, <laughs> all the rate payers and allows those uh, host facilities to recoup their investment. Excuse me, I've had a cold and it's driving me crazy. I got this cough. <clears throat> I'll do my best. Um, I want to take a moment to talk about equity. It's extremely important to provide equity provisions in these programs. Um, we know that people that are most in need of clean energy benefits uh, are the ones that are least able to afford them. And so we recommend a, a whole set of equity provisions, uh, including both carve outs and additional incentives to be provided in these programs. And I won't go into a lot of detail because we're running out of time, but uh, you can take a look at the slides and we've got a number of reports that go into detail on this. I think I'm gonna skip over the project economics example. Um, Time. So where are these programs adopted? Just a few years ago, I could have counted on the fingers of one hand. Uh, it was basically Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, California. <clears throat> At this point, uh, every time I show this slide, I have to reduce the size of the font because there are so many programs now. Keep in mind, a lot of these are pilot programs but uh, they're not all pilots. Uh, notably, all the states in New England now have some variation on this kind of program. Uh, in Vermont, and this is a little outdated, Green Mountain Power alone has now 4,000 customer batteries installed. <coughs> Obviously, there's a lot of work left to be done, uh, but this shows you that these kinds of programs are widely um, viable. They look a little different in each state, but they're basically um, all sharing some of the key, same key elements. So I mentioned that we recommend funding these things through state efficiency programs. Why is that? If you take a quick look at this table, uh, these numbers are in millions. All right, the, the middle column where it says uh, electric efficiency spending per state. So, for example, in Rhode Island, just to start at the top, uh, you see $104 million annually in efficiency spending, Massachusetts, $620 million annually, and so forth. These are enormous programs. They far outweigh the investment that's in uh, utility demand response programs. So it makes sense uh, just simply from a funding perspective that if you're going to add new technologies like batteries into an existing program, put it where the money is. Um, furthermore, these programs are well established. Uh, they have marketing. They often have uh, equity. Uh, uh, provisions already included, such as low or no cost financing. 
Finally, we really need to expand the definition of efficiency to accommodate new technologies and grid modernization, uh, such as virtual power plants. Well, we have lots of information available at our website. <coughs> Here's a few of our reports on the topic. Um, I want to call everyone back to participate in the questions and discussion session. Um, and I will do my best to not cough through it. Um, so first question, uh, and Ryan, I think I, you know, I have some is about this, but I want to ask you if you've come across anything. Um, you know, as I showed on that list, there, there are a number of programs, number of pilot programs and established programs. Um, you know, here in Vermont, for example, Green Mountain Power is going full speed ahead on this concept. They've got customer batteries, they've got uh, wireless, remote, you know, controllable thermostats, water heaters, um, they're experimenting with EV chargers, they're doing everything they can to uh, in, enroll and include their customers, uh, you know, in, in trying to form virtual power plants. That's pretty unusual. Uh, seems like most utilities really take a rather dim view of this. And I'm wondering, I think we know why, but I'm wondering if you have any sense of specifically what needs to change in order to uh, incentivize or otherwise encourage utilities to start to enroll their customers and resources and and given that it it makes economic sense what needs to happen to make it make sense to the utilities yeah no it's a, it's a great observation it, it's a bit hard to generalize i mean I, th I think there are some unsung heroes among the utilities in this space uh, that a lot of people aren't familiar with you know otter tail power comes to mind i think the last I had looked, they had about 15% of their peak under control through demand response. And those are programs they're they're actively using and they're winter, you know, relatively small winter peaking investor owned utilities. So that there definitely are you know important success stories for us to recognize. But but when we look at you know what is the cost effective potential for VPPs or demand flexibility, we often do find that there's there's a lot of, in our view, untapped potential that is being left on the table. Um, you know, I think. And I think to, for utilities to do more of this, I think there are two things that need to change. One is um, a lot of times we do encounter utilities or system operators um, who don't yet trust the ability of VPPs to operate uh, and perform the way a gas peaker might or a utility scale battery might. Um, just pushing the button and getting it to run is a little different when you think about the fact that there are customers on the other end of this. Um, and there, I think, you know, some combination of, of just further demonstration of the, the performance of VPPs through pilots, through full-scale programs is important. But there also has been more of this that's happened than people realize. And so I think just drawing more attention among the regulatory community and the utilities to <clears throat> all of the resources that are already out there and performing well can help to uh, address some of those myths. And then on the on the on the the other issue on kind of on the financial side is you know getting utilities business models aligned with this opportunity um there you know we've seen some innovation around performance incentive mechanisms performance based rate making that is intended to address that that barrier and provide that that uh, financial opportunity i don't know that there are any really obvious success stories to point to there it's still more kind of in the experimentation stage but that's i think a key area that's that's ripe for innovation Okay, great. So we have tons of questions. Um, somebody has asked about FERC Order 2222 and how that, what that has to do with the whole VPP sort of um, evolution. Um, and th for those who don't know, FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and Order 2222 basically says that um, um, grid operators in ISO and RTO areas, which is a good portion of the country, need to start to make um, wholesale energy markets accessible to distributed resources. So with that background, anybody want to jump in on this? What is, uh, the, how does the need for virtual power plants interface with FERC order 2222? 
Um, you know, my, my quick comment on that, like you said, Todd, is the idea is to create a level playing field for, for distributed energy resources to come in and compete with large scale, you know, supply side resources in those markets. Um, I think, you know, there are cases where market rules still tend to be very oriented toward the operational characteristics of large scale power plants and not oriented toward some of the both uh, sort of unique benefits and unique constraints that are associated with running a VPP. And so the, the theory behind order, there's still a lot to be worked out with kind of order 22, 22 compliance, but the theory is that it allows all of these resources to come in and compete so that we get the most cost effective, you know, economically optimal solutions uh, in, in power markets. And I want to add um, just a little bit to sort of see it in action. Um, my favorite new website is gridstatus.io. And you can see that um, under, for ISO New England and New York ISO, behind the meter solar is, um, they, it, it tracks, you know, what, what resources are going to the grid, you know, right now in this moment in time. And so in ISO New England, you can literally see when, the solar, the behind the meter solar starts coming on in the daytime. I mean, and you can see the the uh, how large that is in ISO New England um, compared to other parts of the country. So you can you can see it in action there. Okay, great. Uh, here's a question for Seth. Have you studied implications to workforce with regard to shutting down peakers and programs? or ways that impacted workers can transition to new careers in the new, on the new grid? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And it, it is something that we've certainly looked at. And, you know, uh, there, there are going to have to be transitions um, in, in the transition, or work transitions in the, the, uh, the transition away from fossil fuels. Peaker power plants are not big job creators. It takes very few people to run a peaker power plant. I mean, some of these are, are just, you know, a few people can run a whole fleet of, of peaker power plants. We've seen this again and again. Utilities don't really release a lot of information about that, um, but what we have found has shown that there are just very few jobs that are, are, are tied to these plants. We're in New York City, we're working very closely with uh, the New York Power Authority, who has six peaker power plants in operation there. And they are looking at how they can uh, work with their existing workforce to be able to make that transition. They have uh, committed to shutting down their fossil peakers by 2035, hopefully 2030 now, uh, and replacing them with batteries. So they're looking at retraining opportunities and ways to um, make sure that their current existing workforce has the skills to, um, to be able to, to provide more, more clean resources. Now on the VPP side, there is a huge workforce gain in the installation of all of these distributed resources. So it's a big job creator as opposed to peaker power plants and even large battery systems, which also don't have a huge workforce. But the, the um, workforce to install and maintain uh, distributed resources has huge potential. Okay. Uh, somebody is asking about the lifespan of stationary batteries. Uh, estimated 15 to 20 years versus 50 plus years for peakers. Where does the replacement cost of these show up in the financial models? And are you seeing anything in technology development that would extend the lifespan of storage systems? Uh, my quick answer to that, if it is a question about our analysis, is we were doing everything on an annualized basis to make sure that the costs and the benefits that we were comparing in our study were apples to apples. Um, so that annualization does account for the fact that batteries have, yeah, maybe 15, 20, maybe 10 year life, depending on your assumptions about augmentation. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, you know, in general, when we're looking at these economic analyses over longer time periods, it always does incorporate the replacement costs of batteries, which are less than the additional, the, the installation costs. And you got to remember too, there's ongoing costs with fuel supplies for, for bigger power plants and gas prices have been quite erratic lately and, and trending upward. So there are ongoing costs for fossil fuels for sure, um, in addition to carbon emissions and pollution. Okay, uh, I think this is gonna have to be the last question, unfortunately, because we're a little over time. Um, somebody wants to know if, we, if anyone has begun integrating this research with grid interactive efficient 
uh, building concepts? So we so so I was actually part of a team that, along with LBNL, led the development of, of DOE's Grid Interactive Efficient Building uh, National Roadmap a couple of years ago. To me, there's I mean there's there's a ton of overlap between these two concepts, and in particular because we're typically talking about commercial and industrial customers when it comes to VPP, um, they're, they're almost one you know one and the same thing. Um, so I think it's yeah, almost a terminology issue, a definitional issue, um, but those those. Both terms, I think GEBS and VPPs have really caught on in the industry and are generating a lot of excitement. And, and to me, um, you know, how we think about their benefits, how we think about their costs and their integration into, into markets is um, it, it's essentially the same issue that, that we're looking at there. Great. Well, I'm sorry that we didn't get to more questions. Um, I do want to thank all of the speakers. And uh, to those who asked, yes, the slides and the recording of the webinar are available or will be available shortly on our website. And uh, Samantha, you have a few final words? Yes, um, the last thing I'll say, I know we're running a minute or two late here. Um, we've got another webinar that we just scheduled for the end of August that is shaping up to be very interesting, um, leveraging federal funding for transmission technologies and renewable energy integration. That's on August 22nd. So again, all these materials from today's webinar will be posted and we hope to see you at the next one. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.